You are now listening to Sorel Gore, 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 MD. Sorel Gore, MD. Now, welcome to part two of how to read a cervical spine MRI. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about anatomy. And uh, so, what I have here is the axial images here on the left, screen left, and on screen right, I have the sagittal set of images. These are T2 weighted images. We know that because the uh, fluid surrounding the cervical cord is white, so that's T2 weighted imaging. And let's just go through the anatomy, real, real basic stuff. All right, we're in the midline here, and midline sagittal is where you're going to see the most anatomy in one image, and you can really understand what's going on. Uh, so, real basic broad strokes here, real basic, basic broad strokes. Uh, anteriorly, we're going to have the spinal column. All right, cervical spinal column all through here. Just behind that, we're going to have uh, the actual nerve tissue. We're going to have the cord, you know. Um, in the cervical spine portion, we're going to have the cord. But above that, and still somewhat visible, is the um, posterior fossa structures, also sometimes the medulla and pons, and then the cerebellum. So, But that's obviously not the focus. The focus is the cord, but just kind of know that you have uh, brain tissue here that kind of turns into the cord, so there's that transition here, uh, the brain stem going into the cervical cord. And then posteriorly here we're going to have the posterior elements, um, and at this level what we're going to see in the midline is we're going to see the spinous processes. The spinous processes are these osseous structures here. We know it's got this uh, kind of gray signal here, black uh, cortical signal, and then all this is just muscle tissue. Uh, the muscle tissue is not really that important, but it's just to, to know it's there. Um, and as you keep going posteriorly, you'll see here the subcutaneous tissue and then the skin. So basically, uh, two biggest things here really are going to be spinal column, cord, uh, fluid surrounding the cord, the CSF, uh, spinous processes are here. Now, if we go side to side, we're going to see the posterior elements here on the sagittal. And these are very important. Um, especially when we're talking about uh, degenerative changes. Um, and just so you know here, these are the facet joints. We can actually see the bone of the uh, intraarticular, uh, the pars intraarticularis, and then this dark signal is where the joint is actually going to be. Uh, these are actually true joints with, um, there is a little bit of fluid in there, uh, lubricating this joint and allowing for flexion or movement at that joint. So just keep in mind that there's facets on either side, so again, just to get the, the broad brush strokes down, uh, spinal column, cord, uh, spinous processes, posterior elements, including the uh, facet joints. All right. just, and just keep in mind, as we're talking about numbering, um, just keep in mind that a facet joint is always going to be between two levels, um, whereas the actual pars intraarticularis, the, literally the portion in between the articular portions, is going to be at the same level. So, uh, speaking of levels, let's just talk a little bit about numbering. So, um, this den, this is the dens right here. This is C2. So, you're going, going to have C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's going to be the last cervical vertebral level. And this is going to be T1. If I swing out, I can see the rib associated with T1, so I know that's T1. Um, C1 is a little bit of a funky level. Um, doesn't look like the others. You get an anterior arch and you get these big lateral masses. Um, so that's so that's C1. So that's that's your numbering. Uh, let's go into a little bit more detail here. So what is the spinal column? We're talking about uh, vertebrae, which are you know bones, all right, kind of brick-like bones, and in between we have the disc tissue. So here we can see kind of an interme intermediate gray signal. Uh, the vertebral levels, and then the intervertebral discs. Um, and then, then keep in mind, within the disc, there's sort of some separate portions. Basically, the center of the disc is very juicy, for lack of a better term, filled with fluid. And then as we go lower down, we can actually see that here, that the T2-weighted signal of the inside of the disc is, is high relative to the periphery of the disc. So I kind of think of it like a gusher for whatever reason. It just sort of reminds me of a gusher. Uh, the gusher had that uh, juicy bit on the inside, and a little bit more firm on the on the periphery. Same thing going on here with the discs. 
some other structures which are important, but you may not really see them or you sort of have to look for them, is that if you notice here this low signal surrounding the column, those are actually ligaments. Um, and this, in this case, this is going to be the posterior longitudinal ligament. And uh, ligaments sort of hold tissues tight together. And it's important to identify if ligaments have been disrupted. And notably, if you know about the ligament, the location, um, you can diagnose a ligament disruption because you will focally see some high signal uh, disrupting that ligament at potentially at a, one of these cervical levels. Uh, so then moving into the cord and the, uh, the thecal sac, the, the thick dural sac that surrounds the cord, protects it and bathes it, lubricates it with the CSF, the fluid. We see the fluid really well. That's the white. And then we have the cord tissue here, kind of an intermediate gray. And um, again, this is the most sensitive piece of tissue on the screen. This is what you really want to evaluate. And you want to see if there's something going on here. And I'm not really getting into the search pattern. I'm going to leave that for another video. But um, just keep in mind that this is literally the nervous tissue extending from the brain down, down your spine. And then at each level, which you, you can see better on the axial images, that nervous tissue is going to actually literally split off and form nerves and then travel through these neural canals. So that's the cord. Um, you can also notice just another thing to keep in mind is that thickness of the cord, it's going to be thickest in the cervical region. And then as you extend down into the thoracic region, you, you lose nerve tissue as you lose these nerves, as the nerves split off and go off at each level to innovate your, your body. The, nerve, the, the thick cord of nerve tissue, the actual cord, is going to get thinner as you come down. You sort of get getting an idea of that as you look at this. Um, and then kind of coming even further back into the, the spinous processes, um, there's, there's not a ton to say about them. Um, sometimes you can find fractures here. Uh, sometimes you can find mets here. Um, you just want to know that they're there, and you want to know that they're a continuation uh, posteriorly of the, of the posterior elements, which are better seen um, on a parasagittal view on the, on the sagittal imaging, or you can really see well on the axial imaging. So at the facet joints here on either side, and they connect through the lamina, the la structure called the lamina, right here, and, and form that, that uh, spinous process. So with that, let's actually turn into the anatomy here on the axial. Um, so kind of between the two images, even though you have the exact same imaging information on the axial as you do on the sagittal, uh, theoretically, uh, you're just seeing it differently so you can understand different relationships. What's important about the axial imaging is that you can understand at each uh, intervertebral level, at the disc level, uh, what's going on. And this is important when you're looking at disc disease, which is pretty much the most common disease that you're going to see on cervical spine MRIs. I remember in residency, we used to see a lot of strange things because it was a large academic center. We'd see cord masses. We would see um, cord lesions, cord myelopathy, multiple myeloma. We saw that a lot. Um, but it turns out in private practice, you don't see a lot of that. What you end up seeing a lot of is really degenerative disc disease. And for that, you're really going to want to use the axial images and just understand some basic relationships. So again, here's our spinal column, which we talked about here. It's right over here. Um, here is that uh, spinous process. You can see it back here. Here we can see a lot better here the lamina, which combine posteriorly to form the spinous process. The facet joints here. And then um, cord here, CSF surrounding the spinal cord. This is where the posterior aspect of the disc would interface with the cord and potentially cause narrowing. So that's that's an important interface to know about. So kind of, and with the cord here, we have these openings in the osseous structure of the of the the cord in the vertebral column, where nerve tissue from the cord can actually exit as a nerve and go out and inter innervate the body. So kind of to, uh, to sum up there, you basically have your vertebral column, cord. This is where the nerves exit. This is the, some people, it's called a neural canal. Some people call it a neuroforamen. Some people decide that foramen is not appropriate for this area, and that, that is what it is. Uh, but, you know, some people call this the central canal, the canal holding the cord, and then the neural canal. And I, I think those are nice, simple terms to use when, when understanding these things. Um, 
if we come to a, not an intervertebral level, but actually the vertebral level, we can then see the nice structure of the vertebral body itself, uh, very nicely laid out in axial imaging. Basically, vertebral body, pedicle, uh, lateral mass, this could be the pars interarticularis as well, uh, lamina here, and then this continues as the spinous process, which we see when we scroll because the spinous processes are pointed downwards, so we're going to have to scroll to see them. Uh, another structure to keep in mind, you see it well on the axial, is this, um, these transverse processes with a foramen here for the vertebral artery. Uh, that is an important structure to know about. You, better, you see it better on CTA, but um, it is there. And of course, you have all this soft tissue, which again, really when you're looking at a cervical spine MRI, although it's important to review that area, what you're really concentrating on is this very sensitive nerve tissue that's, you know, again, within the uh, central canal, and then you're also interested in the nerves that are exiting within the neural canals. So that's pretty much it. That is the anatomy that you need to know for cervical spine MRI. Uh, we kind of went through it all. Uh, just to sum it up again, uh, vertebral column, C2, you go down to C7, the core here hanging out in the thecal sac, a nice thick dural line sac with CSF and the cord. Uh, the spinous process is hanging out here, facets on either side. Then on the axial imaging, we're seeing uh, the vertebral column here anteriorly, central canal here containing the cord, and then neural canals here to the sides as these nerves exit and go on to innervate the body. Um, that's kind of about it. It's Rogue RMD. Thanks for watching.